All right, cool. Can, is, this, is the sound good? Yep. Okay, awesome. So hey, everybody. It's awesome to be here. Uh, I'm sure that you guys all love Full Stack and Grace Hopper. I really loved my experience there. As um, Alexander told you, I was part of the September cohort, so 1609, and I graduated in uh, December. And um, you know, the reason I'm here is because I loved Full Stack so much from all points of view, what I learned, where it got me today. Uh, the people I met, in fact, like two days ago, I was with like 10 other people from my cohort. We just hung out in, in Manhattan at night. It was really awesome. So like we formed really cool, really good bonds and uh, I'm sure that you guys have as well. So um, I'm, I just wanna kind of give back or share anything that I can do um, with, with you who are in, the, in a similar situation that I was in a few months ago. So I guess I'll start by giving you a bit of background about myself just so you kind of know who I am, where I come from. Uh, before full stack, I had just graduated from college last May. I had a degree in mathematics, a bachelor's, and um, I'm sure that a lot of you will relate with this, but I was very interested in entrepreneurship. And throughout college, even back in high school, I would conceptualize ideas for products and things I wanted to build out, right? And every time that I, that I did that, I found myself in this frustrating situation where I was like, oh, I, can't, I don't have the technical skills to, to turn it into reality, whatever I wanted to create. And so I needed a technical partner. And I wanted to become that technical partner, or at least be able to help with it. And so that was the main reason I came to Full Stack. So last, I think, like, June 1st or something, 2016, I wrote my first line of code ever, which, was, <laughs> which is really funny thinking back now. Um, but then I, I discovered Full Stack, applied to Full Stack, uh, got in, was really excited fell in love with it to the point where I wanted to now start a career in software engineering. It wasn't just about having the skills to maybe launch a company later on. It was about like becoming a software engineer. And I'll admit I had some doubts at the beginning when I came into Full Stack. I was like, would it be really possible for Full Stack to take someone like me who has no experience coding, right? And get to bring me to a level or help me get to a level where I'm employable by tech companies. And um, I think it became overwhelmingly clear throughout the program, like at the rate that I was picking stuff up, the, the amount of support here and everything, that that was gonna be the case. And obviously, as Alexander said, I was, super, I was super thrilled a month ago when I finally signed an offer with Google and I'll be starting uh, Monday, which I'm super excited about. Finally, I get to, to kind of start working. And that's that, that's kind of my background. That's who I am. You, you know everything there is to know about me now or, or almost everything there is to know. Um, but I guess I, now I wanna, I wanna dive into the interview process or the, the, the job application process and then the interview process, how you can navigate it, what I experienced through it. And I guess I, I will just start with like a mini disclaimer that I'm not representing anybody, I'm not representing my future employer or, or any other company that I might have interviewed with. This is just like my experience. And I think it might be even more valuable because you get to really see what someone who was in your shoes almost exactly right, went through. Um, but so yeah, it's gonna just be my experience and, and some of my friends' experience. So there are like, I think there are three things about the interview process and that job application process that you, that I would say you have to kind of be ready for. The first one is, is expectations in regard to time frame. okay? And that was something that I was really kind of, not necessarily worried about, but I thought about this a lot while I was at Full Stack. And so what I mean by that is do not, or if I were you, I wouldn't, expect to get your first offer or an offer or get a job at any point in time. Meaning don't expect to get it in a week or don't expect to get it in five months. Because basically it, it seems as though it can happen at any time. I've had friends, like very close friends from Full Stack, who literally got their offer, the one that they signed and accepted, a week after graduation. Like there was a girl who got it, I think the, the day, two days after Christmas. So that's what a Christmas gift, right? Or what a, what a winter break gift. Um, but so that was really fast. And some of you are probably gonna be that lucky. And then there are people like me who had to wait like four months, right? Um, and I'm sure that there are some people who might wait even a bit longer. So like, don't have expectations in, term of, in terms of time frame. I think you, it's better so that you don't set yourself up for, for disappointment or, you know, or, or for something else. I, I know that I was like disappointed at first because I thought it would go faster for me. Now, 
The second thing I think that's important is also expectations, but in regards to the number of offers that you'll get. Um, again, don't think that you're going to get one offer. Don't think that you're going to get 10 offers. Because again, it turns out that some people get one or two, like me. And then some people will be like juggling <laughs> with like seven offers, which is an awesome position to be in. But again, you, you can't really expect because it's so hard to be able to tell whether or not a company is going to give you an offer, extend you an offer, who's going to be extending an offer to where, to what, when. That again, I, if I were you, I would not have expectations in regards to that because you might set yourself up for disappointment or it just might not happen at all like you thought it would. And now we arrive to the final part, which I think is the, the, most, ex the most important part, and that is uh, the interview process, right? Navigating through it, or rather the, the, the job process. Let's not call it interview process, because interview is part of it. But the job process, navigating it, and, um, and like what the parts of it are, right? So here, at the risk of making a comparison to React, I think that the, the job process has a lot of different components. And that's the, the end of that comparison. Um, I see that you're laughing, which is awesome. Um, but so, yeah, there are a lot of components to, to, the, to the job application process. And I would say the main ones, and the ones I'm going to talk about are, number one, job applications, like applying, right? Number two is going to be recruiter phone calls. Number three is going to be behavioral interviews. Don't think that you, you're not necessarily going to get behavioral interviews. Number four is going to be technical, technical phone interviews and technical on-site interviews. And number five is going to be prepping for those technical interviews. And I guess like, there's also the sort of post-offer stage, right? Like <laughs> negotiating and all that. Um, but I think Jaren's probably made a really good job at kind of covering all those things, or she will soon enough. Um, and I think I've, I've gathered more experience in the others than that, <laughs> since I only ended up with one or, one or two offers. Now, um, let's start with the application process, like just applying, right? And here, similarly to before with the expectations thing, some people are going to have like, a very easy time with one of these components and a very hard time with another one, and others it's going to be the opposite. Right? For me, it so happened to be that the, the most frustrating, hard, brutal, like emotionally brutal part was this applying to jobs thing. Right? Applying to jobs and, and um, more precisely, and when I say emotionally brutal, is because not being given a chance to like, prove yourself in the least bit because of like automatic rejections or being ignored is is like the worst feeling in the world. Um, but so I'll share a bit of insight into the, the different ways you can apply to jobs, right? Number one is online applications. That's what I did the most. Probably was a mistake. I know that you know some people at full stack, some of the staff warned us against that. But for me, obviously it was I guess it was kind of the easiest way to apply, right? You just go on company websites, like on their websites, on their job boards, and you apply. That's what I did the most. And but I didn't like I didn't, you know, not take it seriously. I applied myself, right? Cover letters, speci like specific cover letters for specific companies, showing interest, finding positions that fit me to the T in terms of description, like, you know, React, Node, no work experience, um, <laughs> right? No work experience being key, right? Because um, also, by the way, quick side note, I had no work experience, not only as, as a software engineer, obviously, but also, period. Because um, I came from college and I, my internships were a bit like, it was a bit of a unique situation, let's put it that way. But, um, but yeah, so, so that was what I was looking for. And I, if, I, if I can give you my sample, right, and it's kind of statistically significant, I think I had at least 150 plus online applications, like job applications. By that I mean going directly on the website or doing like LinkedIn auto applies, like, like with the resume thing, or um, uh, Indeed, you know, job boards like Indeed or monster. And of those, <laughs> um, don't be afraid, but that's, I'm just sharing the truth with, me, uh, with you. Of those, I got uh, two, two replies, two good replies. Everything else was either, I'd say, like half ignored, nothing, half um, automatic rejection. Um, I got two replies. One of them, two days later, canceled on me and told me, actually, we're looking for someone with more experience. And one of them went forward with the interview process. So my advice here, Definitely not the best way to go about applications of online like that. Second way to apply to jobs is emails, right? Um, and by that I mean like there's some companies, and that's kind of the luck of the draw, right? Some companies that on their job listings it says like email us at blah 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 jobs.com. Or if it's like a small startup, sometimes you're emailing the founder, right? 
And those, I mean, obviously there are fewer of those, but I'd say, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 10, 20, or yeah, 10, 10 maybe applications, and I'd say about half will reply. Um, so it starts to get better, right? Positive energy. Um, and uh, they'll reply, and you kind of start the interview process, especially usually when you're, when you're emailing like the CEO or some, kind, some person in the founding team, and it goes directly to their inbox, they'll tend to answer. answer. Then there's um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn messages, uh, or direct email to some, like you find someone's email somehow by putting like your stocking hats on and, and finding their emails with like Chrome extensions or whatever, and you email them directly, but kind of unsolicitedly. And that also has like a relatively high response rate, I'd say, it's probably 50%, 40%. I didn't do too many of those, but, but it's definitely better. And of course, you'll have people who ignore you, right? Um, on LinkedIn, especially like if you, ju if you just send a, a request for connection, but with no message, you'll probably get accepted, but then you're like, especially if it's someone with like, you know, a thousand connections or whatever, they're probably gonna ignore you after that. Um, I did find that the, the best way there was email. Like if you find someone's email and you email them, that, ten, I don't know, there's something about email maybe, and I think for me too, like I check my email like 24 seven, right? Or not 24 seven, but very often, right? So email seems to be really good. Um, now, the, the last way, which is by far and away the best one, uh, granted, in, because of the low number of applications that I did this way, I don't have, I don't know if it's statistically, statistically significant, but referrals or in-person connections, right? By in-person connection, connections, I mean hiring day, you know, you meet, you meet the recruiter there, you're talking to them face-to-face, -face. or career fairs, if you, if you can't, went to college and you can still go to career fairs, or maybe like meetups. I didn't go to meetups, but I went to stuff like hiring day. And also I got referrals from close friends, um, and I got one referral from, um, through David, David Yang. And um, these, these is 100% uh, positive return rate, or like 99%. Probably but there's one, one that like ended up not happening, you know? But all of them, you'll, you'll not only like, you know, if you met someone at career day or hiring day, you will, you'll email them like two days later or the next day and they'll answer you and you'll start the interview process. Or a referral, you know, you're waiting, your friend tells you, yeah, I put in the referral, I wrote like a huge thing about you or whatever, and then the next day you have someone contact you telling you, you know, we're interested in, con in contacting you. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the best way. Now, the thing is, it, it's hard because like, for the grand majority of these companies, the internal processes are kind of rigorous in the sense that, you know, they expect you, they expect the person referring someone to know them pretty well, right? And oftentimes you have to write some kind of like mini application or, you know, I know such and such like this, I can vouch for them for this and that reason. Um, and so for me, it was through close friends, either, you know, from high school or college who are now working in the tech field or from, you know, a couple students from full stack who knew someone and could really vouch for me that way. Um, but so that's that, that's the application process. For me, it was the toughest part, probably because I did it wrong. You know, I went with the online application thing, but so you, now you know kind of what I went through. Um, and it seems as though from what I've heard from my friends, similar kind of numbers. Now, second part is the recruiter phone call. Recruiter phone call is like I do not overlook it because you have to do it to, to, get, the, to get the job to start the interview. Um, I think it's hard to mess up the recruiter phone call because it's usually more of like, this is what you can expect from us. Tell me a bit more about yourself. And then are we both interested in moving forward? So like, unless you're either completely an asshole or you uh, suddenly say, oh, I'm not interested actually, you know, because suddenly, oh, you want, you're not hiring a software developer, you're hiring like, something else, then okay, then that's not gonna work out. But otherwise, usually like the recruiter phone call will be good, but you know, do it, prepare. I think Jaren will have you prepare like kind of an introduction speech that's always good to have. Um, and that's the recruiter phone call. Now we get to behavioral interviews. So behavioral interviews, the reason I said earlier, like don't think that you're not gonna get them is because believe it or not, and I was surprised, I got a lot of behavioral interviews, like pure behavioral interviews, meaning not technical, just behavioral. Now, it depends on the companies, admittedly. I interviewed at a few like finance companies, um, hedge funds, these kinds of companies, and you'll, they're gonna have like most likely a behavioral interview. I had one company where, I'm not joking, I had the final on-sites were eight back-to-back -back 
behavioral interviews with like a few technical questions interspersed. And that was, by the way, the most I've ever had like in one day. But it was eight back-to-back -back, uh, behavioral with various people of the, in the company. Um, so like behavioral isn't, it's not bad, right? Like in fact, it's probably a bit more relaxing, you could say, than technical. But it's, it, it can be hard, right? If you're not prepared or, or maybe you say something that like they don't like or you know you don't fit with them or their culture. Um, so there's definitely, for that, I would, I would just advise you to prepare yourself, be yourself, make sure that you're applying to companies where you think that there's like a personality match, if that makes sense. Like companies have personalities, kind of, the culture that they're fostering, right? Um, and, then, and then so sometimes technical interviews, or not sometimes, pretty much like 99% of the time, technical interviews are implicitly behavioral, right? Like under the hood, they're also testing like, do I like this person? Would I like to work with this person? So especially at small startups, but even big, big companies where you're gonna be working in a small team, your interviewers are gonna be like, would this person fit in that small team? You know, do we like them? And so again, here it's more a matter of being yourself, like I think, and, and showing some kind of personality. Not saying crack jokes or whatever. If you can, if you have that kind of interviewer, then obviously by all means go ahead. And, or if you have like similar interests, if you have something unique on your resume, like you know, I had something where like I, I streamed myself playing video games for a while, and that was kind of unique. And believe it or not, like I'd say 80% of my interviewers asked me about that thing. So if you have something unique, I don't know, you like climbing mountains or something, put it down there because I think that's kind of what will help you for that behavioral part, or at least that like culture fit. It can help create rapport, let's put it that way. Um, okay, so that's behavioral. Now we get to the crux of the matter, the, the sort of the, the biggest, the most important one, the technical interviews. So you've got, you've got phone screens, right, where they call them for phone screens, they're phone interviews, and then you've got on-site interviews. So phone interviews, you're gonna be doing them, they're, they're, they're typically done on the computer, on like a shared code editor, and for me, they were all on the phone, which is kind of annoying that you wouldn't use Skype or Google Hangout or some kind of voice chat, because then you have to put your phone either on speakers or you have to put your phone in like with earbuds. Um, and phone interviews, they're, they're almost the same, I would say, at least based on my experience, as on-site interviews in terms of like what they're testing, right? The same kind of problem, but um, the way you approach them is a bit different just because you don't see the person in front of you, right? And uh, they're, they're tougher in that way, in my opinion, because you, you can't measure how is the person responding to what I'm saying. Like, is that person like yawning right now? Like, do, this, do they like think that I'm doing terribly? And they can't see what you're doing. So like, you might be stressing like, oh, what, like, what do I look like? Even though they can't see you, you know? Um, but so, I don't know, there, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a different beast than on-site interviews, but the way you prep for them from a technical point of view is just the same way, right? Um, and I think you can expect most companies to have technical phone interviews. And uh, you know, the one advice I would, one piece of advice I would give you is to try to pr try to ask the company as much as possible, like your recruiter, right? Um, what you can expect from these phone interviews. Like I've asked people, uh, is this phone interview going to be more algorithm style questions, or is it going to be more like? Uh, like uh, you know, JavaScript fundamental, like theory, you know, CS theory. What should I expect? Because those, by the way, are very different. And we'll get into the the whole like how to prep for interviews. But like, if you're getting, at, if you're applying for a front end engineering role or just an engineering role, but you don't know that you're going to be tested on front end stuff, and you get like a CSS question or or just like a JavaScript fundamental question, a la what's prototypal inheritance, or like, can you give me an example of closure? That's very different than, you know, like find the, you know, invert a binary tree. Those are like two, two different ball games completely. Um, and like just, if I were you, try to do as much research on the company also online, Glassdoor, these kinds of things, what questions to expect. Even though like a lot of the big tech companies or, or startups, tech startups, it seems as though most companies are, are adopting the whole like algorithm intensive interviews, but some of them will ask different stuff like JavaScript fundamentals. So try to do your research, ask questions, be prepared for that. Um, and for the on-site interviews, like I said, kind of similar, similar thing. You're just in person this time. Uh, they'll offer you either a whiteboard or a computer or both. Believe it or not, I had a lot of companies offer me the computer to write on um, or to code on. So like, even though whiteboarding is super popular, you might get a computer and 
I've, at least I heard from other people, you know, online or whatever, say, like, I wasn't expecting a computer and I forgot how to type code. Like, I only knew how to whiteboard code. Don't be that person um, if they force you to use the computer. One thing that, I, that, that was awesome for me is there was one company where I was able to use the computer. I had the choice between the two. And what I ended up doing is I would do, like, the conceptual, like, like analysis of the algorithm or whatever on the whiteboard. And then I'd do the coding on the computer. And I'd literally, like, when I got, like, into it, I'd, I'd, I'd stand up and go back down to the computer. Stand up and, you know, oh, wait, here, we can erase that. Maybe this is an edge case and then go back. And I think, I think uh, that that was good because it showed, like, like excitement it, and it shows that you're kind of comfortable. And especially if you feel comfortable, then that's awesome. You're having a good time with the interviewer and all that. But just all that to say, be comfortable with these things. I did end up buying a whiteboard, like, one week before one of my interviews where I, like, I really wanted to do well. And um, yeah, I, I practiced with the whiteboard. I practiced not having like atrocious handwriting. I got it to like only terrible. And, uh, and that's that. Now, now we get to really, I think, one of the most important parts, which is how do you prepare for these tech interviews? Um, and by the way, after this, I'm going to like open it up to questions. What time is it? It's like 6, 6.30 or 7? OK. Um, so. How do you prepare? For, for those interviews that are like more JavaScript fundamentals, right, or like front end or this kind of stuff, I would highly, highly, highly recommend reading a book called You Don't Know JS. You might have heard of it. It's, it's free on GitHub. Like you Google You Don't Know JS or YDKJS. You'll find it on GitHub and especially chapters on like prototypal inheritance, closures, this kind of stuff, like uh, hoisting, the kind of stuff that you did in foundations, you might have forgot by, forgotten by now. It's important. If you read that book and you really understand it fundamentally, you'll like own those kinds of interviews. And don't find yourself in that situation where you're like, oh no, if I had read Prototypal Inheritance like, like two days ago and brushed up on that, I'd be good, you know. Um, eloquent JavaScript is also good. Um, and then also just like if, if you're applying to front end purely and the, the job tells you CSS or like either your recruiter tells you, you might get asked CSS questions. And I had one interview where like they told me explicitly, you're, this is going to be front end oriented, no algorithms. Try to, obviously, I mean, you put yourself in that situation, so try to prepare for CSS and stuff. Practice with JS Fiddle because those kinds of interviews will be on JS Fiddle, the, um, the thing where you have HTML, CSS, it's like a shared code editor. But practice on that. You don't want to find yourself the day of, like, how do I run my code on this, on this thing? Like, where do I put CSS or whatever? Um, and also, just going back very quickly to the interviews, ask at the beginning of the other interviews what you're allowed to do. I've had, I think, in fact, the majority of technical phone interviews, they'll let you Google stuff if you want to. Like, if you're in the middle of the interview and you're like, I don't know how to center a div, or maybe not center it, but I, I don't know how to do, like, a circle in CSS. Is it okay if I Google it? they might tell you, yeah, go ahead, or sure, do what you have to do, you know? And like, that can be really, really helpful. Um, I had a couple companies do that, or let me do that uh, for phone interviews. Now, okay, so now we get to the algorithm interviews. So put aside the JS fundamentals and the front end stuff, algorithm interviews. For me, that was the grand majority of my interviews. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough how much I think you need to prepare for those. I think that, uh, I, I definitely underestimated them because, so I love this kind of stuff. I love algorithms and every, all that. A lot of my projects, like Stackathon, I heard you guys are in Stackathon right now. That's awesome. Um, a lot of my projects were related to algorithms, like visualization of algorithms and whatever. I did a lot of code wars. I felt really good with code wars, but that actually wasn't like enough. In fact, I, I kind of learned it the hard way when I completely messed up one interview um, because I think that Code wars, number one, you don't, they don't test you for like the speed of your solution sometime, or, you know, sometimes. So you'll end up doing stuff that's not optimal, like double for loops or whatever, instead of some better thing. You'll still pass the test cases and you don't really learn what you should do better. And then also, they don't cover that much like, you know, trees, tries, tries with an I, T-R-I-E-S. Um, linked list, you know, they'll have like one problem on that. Dynamic programming, they have very few problems on dynamic programming. It's probably one of the most important subjects. Um, uh, and so, yeah, code, you, like, don't, if I were you, don't rely just on code wars. Like, uh, uh, unless you're like a genius 
and you think that you're really set for algorithms, I would do definitely a lot of preparation. Now, how do you prepare? What, what are the materials? Um, at this moment, I think the best product out there is Cracking the Coding Interview, which I'm sure you've heard by now. Uh, Cracking the Coding Interview is a book. I think that right now in the market, it's the best product that you have. I did it from A to Z. I read like front to cover, except for like the chapters on C++, Java, and SQL, but everything else, yeah. All the chapters on like different algorithms or different data structures, and then all the moderate and hard questions near the like page 189 of Cracking the Coding Interview, around that page. Very important, do them if I were you. I did them, I'm telling you, like almost all of them, probably a few that I skipped. I would, what I would do is I would, I would do them, like try to code them, struggle through them, type them out, run them against my own test cases, read her solution. If I didn't understand it, and I'll get into that in a second because it's, sometimes it's really hard to understand the solutions. Google it, like try to Wikipedia it, YouTube it, um, and try to like, try to understand it, right? And I did that, and then like the last weekend before some of the interviews, I would redo all of them or like just re-review all my solutions for all of them, right? To the point where after you start to really get good at them, right? You start to notice the patterns really quickly, very easily and all that. Another book that I used, I did only a few problems from that one, is Elements of Programming. So, um, or Elements of Programming Interviews. Uh, uh, look it up on Amazon. It's a pretty good book. It's denser than Cracking the Coding Interview. Like, it, it reads harder. It's in C++. Um, it rolls eyes. Um, and it's got, like, a lot of questions, but hard questions. It's really good. I did a few of them. Um, I would suggest it if you think you need more practice. And then I'll, I'll also add Wikipedia. Great. Like, you'll often find the algorithms, like, famous algorithms on Wikipedia. And they're surprisingly really well written. And then, you know, YouTube, I mean, it's tough because, like, there's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of stuff that's, like, poorly explained or just all over the place or like, you know, you don't really understand how they explain it or it's not what you're looking for or they don't show you the code walkthrough, but it's all helpful. It all helps. If you can kind of like mix all these things together, it helps. Now, back to the shortcomings of Cracking the Coding Interview and then I'll, I'll open it up to questions in a second. The thing about Cracking the Coding Interview, it's awesome. It covers so much, but it, especially for people like us, I think, from full stack, it's got really two big shortcomings. Number one, and this actually applies to not only full stack people or Grace Hopper people, just everybody, the fact that it's got, um, it's only a book, right? It's only text. And like for, for, for complex algorithms, like dynamic programming, understanding a solution via text is so hard. Sometimes like it, it's, just, it's not possible or it, it takes twice as long or three times as long as it would if you had a video, which is why I supported my study with like YouTube videos. Number two, the solutions are in Java. So like, I don't know if you guys have started reading Java, but like, it's not a fun language in my uh, uh, perhaps inexperienced opinion. Um, same for C++ and elements of programming. You kind of teach yourself to read that kind of language, but it's rough, it's tough, and you have to try, sometimes I try to find JS solutions online or Python solutions. Python is like very close to JS, so that's, that's okay. Um, but it was hard finding them. Now, with that, I will just say, and um, so, like, when I was struggling through all this during my interview prep, I was like, there has to be a better way to do this. And so I, I was like, maybe if I, once I land a job and everything, I can start working on something on the side to help solve this. And so what I ended up doing is these past two months, I worked with a close friend of mine who's working as a, as a Go developer in the Valley. He's like really smart, really good. And he also is very interested in algorithms, and so, we decided to create a website that would kind of put all of this in one place, right? One website that has like 100 questions or 101 hand-picked questions of like the best questions that we think are good to prepare for Algo interviews. And the thing that we're doing is we're adding for each question a video explanation with like two parts, a conceptual overview, like the whiteboard part, right? How do you do this algorithm? How do you do the 2D array? How do you build that up, right? And then we do like a code walkthrough where we actually code the thing in front of you, in front of you on a, on a video and tell you like this is why you do, this is how you initialize the array. This is where you do a while loop and this is why you declare the variable like this, right? And then we offer four written solutions in JavaScript, yay JavaScript, Python, Golang, and Java. So um, right now we're like in our alpha stage. After, after my talk, if some of you are interested, I'll, I'll take a few minutes to show you on the computer. Um, you don't have to stay though, of course. Um, but we have like a working website. We have like 
we have like our 100 questions on the website there, and we have like six or seven of them available with videos, with all the solutions in dynamic programming, which I think is one of the most important sections to prep for. But so if you guys are interested, you can stick around and I'll, I'll show you how it works. And by the way, since we're in alpha, like I'd love to give it to you guys for free, right? We're not, we're not selling anything right now. Anyway, that wraps up this part of the talk, whatever you want to call it, le lecture. Um, and so I would love to answer any questions you might have for me. If you have any, um, I'll try to answer them and uh, have at it. Yes. Right. Yeah. So Reacto, I think, is great. Plus, from what I hear from my friends who were fellows, like after after I graduated, Reacto got improved a lot lately compared to my cohort in the sense that you guys cover like at the beginning of the week. From what I've been told, like uh, you cover binary trees or whatever. That's really good. Take Reacto seriously. If I were you, like come in the mornings because I know we had a few people, myself included, who would like by the end, like near Capstone, you're like, yeah that right and you like come in a half hour late or an hour late don't I mean I mean you're only hurting yourself they're really good problems they're exactly the kind especially as they get harder because some of them at the beginning are pretty easy but as they get harder they're the kinds that like you will find in interviews right some of them like vanilla interview questions do them uh, do, do the whiteboard thing do the whole like talking to your to your partner just try to apply yourself and also like if I were you don't be afraid, because at the end of the day, again, this is just for your benefit. You're not necessarily here to follow, like, to do everything to the T. If, say, today you're the interviewer, or you're the, yeah, you're the interviewer, and the question is one that you've never done before, be like, hey, could I be the interviewee, or vice versa. If you're the interviewee, and you're being asked a question that you've done before, just be like, hey, can we try to, like, find a way to switch something up? Because I don't want, like, there's no point in my, in my doing a question that I've already done before. And also, it can be really good to be, on, to be the interviewer because you get to see how someone struggles through the problem, right? Someone else. And you get to see. I, I remember one person for a problem was like balanced parentheses. You guys might have had it already or you, you will have it. Um, and it uses a stack of the solution. And he got it immediately. I was interviewing him. And I remember the way that he got to the fact that he needed a stack was really cool. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, I've, ne I've never thought of that. Um, and it stuck to me. Like, it stuck with me. And, and I mean, I, didn't, I had never got at that question at an interview, but similar stuff, right? And this all helps. So do it. Find a way that makes that works for you. And just if I were, if I were you, do it. Yep. Right. Right. Um, I didn't do open source projects. I did do like one additional project afterwards. Again, it was like a visualization of sorting algorithms. It was great to teach me sorting algorithms and like do it for fun, have another project, which I think for me I kind of needed because I didn't have work experience. If you can do open source and if you can find something where you can actually like contribute, even if, even if a little bit, do it. That's great. Like I think, obviously again, I'm not, I'm not speaking for a company, but I think that's great, especially if you're like, so I applied to one uh, very small startup, and the founder was pretty interested in open source, had done open. In fact, the startup that he was doing used to be open source. So that would 100% click with these kinds of people. So if you can do it, what's the worst that can happen? You'll learn a lot, right? And you'll make connections. So do it, yeah. And put it on your resume. Uh, you were first, and then you. So for for the website or for no, not for, the website. for okay for like in an interview okay so the first thing that I always do that I got myself right at the beginning I didn't do that um, is take care of like edge cases but by edge cases like don't go nuts with edge cases like like uh, you know there are ten billion edge cases like what if they give me like you know something in Python instead of Java that's not an edge case right think stuff like they give me an empty array or they give me an empty string these kinds of things right. Um, and if you're in an interview, immediately ask your interviewer, can we, can we expect that we're not dealing with an empty array? Can we expect that we're not dealing with an empty string? Or do we have to take care of that? If you're just at home, just take care of that. You know, if it's a question where like, the empty array will yield an error, just either you know, return zero, return negative one, return false, return none, return what have you, 
but just kind of try to deal with it. And then, then it can be really tricky to take care of test cases. And I know that for one of the interviews where I told you that I got kind of screwed and that was the humbling aspect where I realized I'm not prepared, one of the things that I did really poorly was test cases. At the end, I, and I got really stressed out because I wasn't doing well in the problem. And at the end, he's like, how can you, wh how would you test your algorithm? It was something with palindromes, okay? It was like, find the, um, the longest palindromic some substring of a string. And uh, at the end, he asked me, uh, so how would you test this? And I started just like, you know, I, I blocked, right? And I just did, I was just like, I, I don't know, like I, I you know, I, I try a few strings and I, I just like, instead of kind of calling myself down and thinking, okay, what is a palindrome? A palindrome is something that's written the same forward as backwards. What are the different, like what, could be something that's different between palindromes. Oh, well maybe they have even length or odd length, right? So you try to find, you try to find these patterns. And again, I know it's easier said than done, but the more practice, the better. And when you, when you are practicing, read up on cracking the coding interview solutions, what she tells you would be good test cases, find people online because you'll start to notice the patterns. Oh, okay, so with dynamic programming, it's always gonna be something about like, indices that are maybe out of bounds or something, or an empty array that's given to you. Or with, um, with strings, it's, or with palindromes, it's always gonna be that. The only, pretty much the only edge case is gonna be the whole like even palindrome or odd palindrome. For linked lists, it's always gonna be some kind of pointer thing that you should take care of. So try to write a test where you see that you're overlapping pointers or something, or you're editing pointers, okay? And Believe me, after doing this a lot and writing them down and everything, you'll, I think they will start to really uh, become concrete. And just if I were you, write them, keep writing them. For me, I didn't write my tests in the form, when I was practicing in the form of like Mocha or, or you know, PyTest or whatever. I just wrote stuff like print or console log knapsack problem of this input equals that. And I just saw if it was like true. So I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'd say I would say um, algorithms um, because like that's all. At least if you apply for just a normal software engineering role, that's all. At least again, based on my experience and based on what I saw in Glassdoor, everybody else, that's all you're going to get asked. Algorithm questions. Um, be prepared with all kinds of algorithms. Be prepared, and, and it's not like, it's not like there's, don't be, don't be, um, don't think that there's an infinite amount of stuff. It's like, it's a finite amount of knowledge. And they're, in fact, they're not really testing knowledge. Most of these big companies are not testing, they're testing knowledge to some extent. Like, do you know what, you have to know what a binary tree is, because you might be asked that. But they're not gonna test like, do you know the algorithm to invert a binary tree? They wanna see, can you figure out how you get to that, right? Uh, can you figure out the pattern? So, and also similarly, like they're, they're likely, I'm not gonna say they're not, but they're likely not gonna tell you, solve the median or, or apply the median of medians algorithm, which is like some famous uh, algorithm to find the, the median of an array in O of n time, in linear time. It's really hard, it's really hard to understand. It's good to understand it. If I were you, I'd Google it tonight and try to understand it, but like they're not gonna ask you that because that's not something that you can expect. Like it's, it's an algorithm that was solved by like, you know, PhDs over X amount of time. They're not gonna expect you to figure it out in the interview. So, they're, so just try to find a way to like, to, under, to, to know how to approach these algorithms. So try to find a way, what are the patterns to solve these problems? And again, I'll give the example of dynamic programming just because that was the, the, the category that I struggled with the most at the beginning. I was like freaking out about dynamic programming. But now, it's like my favorite type of exercise because you start to realize every answer, or almost all of them, at least for the harder ones, involves building a table, a 2D array or a 1D array, and storing solutions to smaller problems and building your final solution like that. Um, and similarly for, for other types of problems, right? Uh, now, for, the, for smaller companies, what I would say is like, one, try to inquire either with your recruiter or Googling online like Glassdoor, uh, what are other websites that tell you? Quora, Quora is awesome. Uh, try to see what kind of the questions they get asked. A lot of these startups are also doing pure algorithms, right? Uh, but some of them you'll notice on Glassdoor, and by the way, like for small startups, you know, like pro tip or like, uh, ha what's the word, um, life hack, 
uh, is go in Glassdoor, or order by like date, find the most recent things, and oftentimes they're the most relevant, right? In fact, sometimes you'll find, you know, they'll, they'll say something and you'll get asked something very similar because people are, that's what they're currently testing. And that's like, it's important just to know what you're gonna be, like the kinds of stuff that you're gonna be asked. So find what it is that they ask, like what kind of stuff, and prep for that. And, and for startups, I would say, emphasize even more knowing about the product, knowing about the, because if you go to like a big tech, like so let's say you're interviewing at Facebook, they're not gonna tell you like, like tell me what you know about Facebook. Like, I, at least I don't think they will, you know? Because you're gonna say like I, like, I use Facebook every day. But, um, or maybe some of you don't, good for you. But um, for a small startup, they might tell you like, why do you like our like, you know, ad tech product that serves ads locally to people in like Uzbekistan. And you should be, you should have a reason to be interested in that. So believe it or not, I think like start to emphasize even more the cultural, behavioral, knowing stuff about them. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, December 12th. So believe it or not, I didn't, I didn't get, uh, I, all my offers, and by all I mean two, came uh, in April, <laughs> a, like a, between April, well no, they, have all, they, so they all came April 3rd, and one of them wasn't even a, an offer, it was we would like to extend you an offer, and I told them at this point I've accepted another offer. Um, and then there was a one more company that I was waiting on, and that I think I had done pretty well on, but I told them as well, like, I have accepted something else. So I'm wondering if I cannot answer that question. So I was lucky. I only went through the on-sites. Um, I the recruiter phone call I think is ubiquitous. But um, after I was lucky to be to be skipped through phone interviews. Not sure why. I think um, they cited that they uh, the combination of my math background and full stack. They did say full stack, which was a really positive like thing for me, like, oh, seems like it's being seen in a better, in a really good light. Um, but so it was only recruiter phone call and uh, on-site interviews. On-site interviews was five back-to-back -back interviews on the same day, and um, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. When did you start doing all the technical stuff? When did you apply for the hours? Uh, say again, when did I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, don't like don't do the mistakes I made. I started my my tech prep when when I started to get the interview. So okay, I graduated December. Nothing happened in like the winter break, early January. Some people well, no, some some stuff happened, but very little. It was more like oh, let's plan a phone call two weeks in two weeks. Um, and I didn't start the really heavy algorithm prep until like I'd say end of January, early February when I started to have an interview scheduled. Bad idea, I think I it would have been better if I'd been able to before. And then, but during that time, that's when I did my fourth project ever. You know, I had three from full stack and then the fourth one I did in December. And, um, and then the, the period between my, uh, when I set up my, my final on-site interview, that's when I spent like, I'd say 10 days like only doing that, like only prepping nonstop. Um, and that, w that worked for me, but like, Pace yourself accordingly. See what works for you. Um, if you're the kind of person who prefers doing it over three months, a few hours a day, do that. If you're the kind of person who's okay with doing like 12 hours a day and like ruining your social life and all that stuff, then do that too, you know. Yep, or wait, was there a question somewhere here? No? Okay. Okay, um, yeah. I contact, I found uh, an email on LinkedIn. I contacted that person on a recruiter, like a, or a recruiting manager, I think, on LinkedIn. He, or not on LinkedIn. I found his email, contacted his email. He then referred me to someone in the company who got the interview process started. I think I had applied, but I didn't hear back. Right. Yeah. 
That's a good, yeah, that's a good question, a really good question. The majority, I would say, maybe I got lucky, were really good interviewers. They did help me. Um, and at least the way I approached it is I treated a lot of these interviews like conversations. So I'd be like, are we on the same page at this point? Like, does this seem to be working out? You know, or if I was stuck, I'd say, you know, if, if like after five minutes you notice that you're kind of stuck, you know, you've been like doing something and then you're like, oh, yeah, this is not working out, I'd be, I'd say something like, you know, what do you think at this point? You know, like literally, I'd ask them as if, I, I do, and I read this somewhere online, I treat them almost as if they were suddenly my coworkers and we were trying to solve the problem together. Now, I had one terrible experience where the interviewer just was not helping and was not, was silent, and it was literally like obvious, and it wasn't an algorithm interview, it was more a, a JS, like an application of JS interview like with like set timeouts, this kind of stuff. And I was like, um, I was like, you know, I was clearly struggling and I was like, are we on the same page? I am not, uh, you are no, or I'm not really sure where I'm going at this point. And it was just like, eh, keep going, keep trying. And I was like, oh, okay, um, I didn't, it didn't pan out. Um, but so I would say that that's the exception to the rule. You'll read horror stories on like Quora where people are like, my interview like spat on me. Um, but, <laughs> but like take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> And I had, a ma like for the grand majority, I had really good uh, experiences with the on-site interviews. Now, re like the automatic rejections online, or, just, or the maybe not automatic, but still rejections online, tend to be like a lot, like, hey, we, we thought you were an amazing person, but, and you're like, come on. Um, but so that's kind of rough. But the on-site interviews, most of them were really nice. And I would say try, just try to have them help you if you can without telling them, give me the answer. Yep. Yeah, I know you said that you were writing the test. Do you know any version of the code that you wrote the test? I know it's super, super well. Yeah. And then you said two minutes and then you did a little more while I was doing it. Well, extra review, so I don't know what it is. Um, but do you know of anyone that did yeah. the test and wrote a book for them? I, I would say, I think a lot of people, so I don't live in the city right now, so it was also like a hassle for me to come to meetups. Um, but I think that the majority of people did go to meetups. I think there's someone from a, uh, one of the next cohorts after me, but with whom I spoke on the phone. His name was Mitch. I think he posted something on Slack recently. Mitch something. I'm sorry, I can't give you the last name. But um, he went to a lot of meetups, I think. Um, and then I think uh, probably, oh, Sophia Chen. I think she was, a, she was from my coach. She was a fellow. Alexandra's nodding, so I got the, the name correct. And she, she can tell that, yeah, she went to meetups, I think, so that would be a good person to contact. Stephanie Manwaring, also a fellow. I think actually a lot of the fellows, Andrew, Gianfrido, Dylan, Powers, they, I think they all went to meetups. So if you w wanted to contact them, I'm sure that they would be like, sure, I'd love to talk or whatever. And then you can always ask Jaren and, and Claudia for help. Yep. What was the first part of the question? Why do you think what? Or like, what should we do with that information? Oh. Like, if you can do it again, would you not have been out those 150 pulled applications? It's not that I wouldn't have sent them out, just because, like, all it takes is one, one offer that you like, presumably. All it takes is one, right? And I did get one positive, two, one of them that fell through, but one positive reply from online, and it went pretty far in the process. So, like, if that had panned out and I hadn't gotten another offer, obviously I wouldn't know if I hadn't applied, but knowing right now, I, I know I'd regret not having applied. Does that make sense? So like, if I were you just, because you never know, like you never know. I've had some friends who I was like, how did you get your job, right? And they were like, oh, I just applied online and they answered the next day. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so like, I can't, I would feel terrible telling you don't apply, don't do that. That being said, if you, if you know people, if you have friends or people in your cohort who you're very close to, try to see if you can get these kinds of referrals. Um, and then otherwise, like, try to do the whole LinkedIn thing, like, which I should, that's what I should have done more. Spending a lot more time on LinkedIn, a lot more time finding people with email addresses on LinkedIn or who say, like, contact me if you want or if you're interested in starting a job or whatever. One thing that I didn't do, I forgot to mention, is uh, like third-party recruiting companies. Can't really speak to that. I know I have a couple friends from our cohort who did do that and had success with it. 
So that might be an avenue to explore. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what I said. Um, if it was like, so okay, if it was someone that I did, whose email I didn't find on LinkedIn, I found with like a bit more sketchy stalking or like using some kind of like application or going on like, you know, they're like old schools like email, phone book or whatever. Um, I just would say like, hey, I came across your information online or something like that. Um, if it's someone that they put it explicitly on LinkedIn, then I'll say, hey, I, I like, How's it going? Or what, it, depends, it depends who it is and how you how you'd speak to them, right? But you'll say, yeah, I found your information on LinkedIn, your email. I would love to, I, I wanted to email you to express my interest in such and such. I'm a student from Full Stack. I have a background in this, blah, blah. Um, if it's someone who, with whom you have some kind of connection, connection like Alma Mater or you know, Full Stack or whatever, say it. You know, obviously, that, that can create a little emotional connection better than just saying, hey, how's it going? Wanted to like, Hit you up, <laughs> but yeah, you got the idea. Oh, yeah. Wait, was there a question as far back? No. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Could you read the last thing? Uh, spread it in what? But like different between two interviews on algorithms, or okay, 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 sure, sure. Um, the math degree I think helped. I mean, apparently it seems like it helped me maybe skip those uh, phone interviews. I think that the the knowledge that I had from that definitely helped with algorithms, because like at the end of the day, algorithms, especially if you start Googling and Wikipediaing algorithms, and you f you'll eventually fall on like. PDFs from universities like you know Cornell.edu or like uh, Northwestern.edu algorithms 301, right? and you're, you're actually like sitting there reading this on vacation, kind of on vacation, I guess. Um, and uh, you'll notice that algorithms class is like algorithm analysis is math. Like, at the end of the day, it's math, um, especially time and space complexity analysis, which is by the way very important. Do practice that because that's also that can like m could potentially make or break you. Um, and so I think that that definitely helped with that pick things up a bit faster. That being said, I don't think that you, you by no means need to be a math major to do well in algorithms or to understand what like log of n means. Like it's not rocket science at the end of the day. Um, uh, now, what the, your second question was, I, I think I focused more on algorithm interviews. Um, and I think the majority were algorithm interviews. I didn't apply to too many companies that, that said like, uh, explicitly we are, you are a web designer or web developer. Most of them were like just the vanilla software developer, software engineer term. There's one company, Lyft, where I got, I was given the choice to apply for either what they call Sway, software engineer, which is like algorithm interviews, or front end engineer, which is, which is a bit of algorithms, but a lot of like JS fiddle stuff. And that's where it helps to talk to your recruiter. I told them, I was like, could I do, could I try both? And I could try both. I was given the chance, to, and I did better in the algorithms. Um, and I moved forward for, with that. So I think that see what you're more interested in um, and uh, kind of try to pick and choose. But that being said, you know, I didn't discriminate against front end specific roles. In fact, by the way, I'm going to be working mostly on the front end. I'm going to be on Google Cloud, and I'm going to be doing, from what I've been told, 95% front end, like Angular, which, by the way, Angular, um, and, and a bit of Python on the back end, which is really cool, because I learned Python right after full stack. Oh, by the way, someone asked, like, projects, prep, interview prep. If you can learn another language, by the way, learn another language. Like, become familiar with another language, because at the end of the day, like, you're not going to learn C++ in a week. Sorry to break any, like, dreams if some of you have that out there. Um, but, but, like, if you can, learn familiarize yourself with a new language, Python, I would highly uh, recommend, like Python is very similar, it's exceedingly similar to J JavaScript. It's awesome to write in, it's awesome to read. In fact, for, for our website, our videos, the code walkthrough is filmed in Python because I think it discriminates against the least amount of people. Everybody can read Python, like everybody. It, it can get to read Python. 
I did my interviews in Python, or, or some of my interviews, including um, uh, Google. And I didn't know Python out of full stack. Uh, I, I, I started learning it like very actively, working on it, and I did all or 90% of my algorithm prep in Python. And then you start to, you start to, by, believe me, when you when I say that, you'll start to get like almost better at it than JavaScript to the point where I had one interview where they wanted me to code in JavaScript, and even though that didn't really cost me anything, but I literally forgot dot length, array dot length. I was writing, like I had an error in my code because I was writing len of array, which is the Python way to do it. And I was like, I was like what is happening? And they were like, um, oh, you may have mistaken the length. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been learning other languages. And it's, and, but nobody, nobody really cares about these kind of syntactic errors. All that being said, Python, great language to learn. And I forget what the question was exactly or why I brought on Python, <laughs> but Python is a great thing to learn. Any other questions? Yep. Right. For me, what, and obviously this is going to, I mean, you're here, you're, this is an opinionated question, right? What I'm going to tell you is not going to be, you're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to do it like him. You're going to choose what, what works for you. But for me, what, what mattered the most at the beginning was like, I'd love to work at a company whose product I believe in, whose product I like, ideally whose product I even use. So like companies that were really high up on my list were companies like Google, like Twitch, twitch.tv, for any of you who like video games, nice, I see the nodding, um, Quora, uh, Robinhood, the like uh, stock trading app on your phone. Um, so these were all my like kind of like the, the dream companies, the products that I use, the products that I believe in and everything. Then culture, um, I also was interested in some hedge funds that I thought looked really cool. Uh, I really liked their product or, or their, their like videos and their websites online. Um, I liked what they kind of advertised about them and all that. So that was for me the most important. That being said, you're it's very, you're, you'll soon realize if you're in the same position as me that like you're not going to be able to just pick and choose from them, right? Um, and then you start to develop and you start to develop an interest in a new company that you don't know anything about. And then you start to also value the role. Like, oh, does this role look cool? Do the technologies look cool, the things that they use? You know, let's just say that you do not want to work in like Backbone. If you find a company that advertises you must be willing to learn Backbone, don't apply, right? Um, but yeah, then kind of prioritize. And then obviously, sure, salary, but like you, you can't, at least for me, you can't just like, you can't just say like, I'm only going for X amount of salary when you're waiting four months, you know? Um, yeah. Cool, so if there are not any more questions, unless there are any more questions, um, nope, okay. I'd love to just take a few minutes to show you uh, what we have and just give any of you who are interested access to the website. Um, but by all means, if you don't want to stay, don't worry about it. I won't be sad. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, cool. So what, what you'll do basically is um, the website is called algoexpert.io. So you guys can see correctly, right? So you will see algoexpert.io. You'll go to algoexpert.io. Right now we have this restricted alpha thing. Um, but if you, the password is, this is where you dim the lights, uh, the password is going to be full hopper, okay? One word, no, um, no capitalizations or anything. So you enter it, and now you're on the, the website. So here you can read our homepage if you want. You'll have like what we're about, like what, what we do. Um, and then if you go to, so then you'll, you'll log in. Log in will save your progress. So you'll log in. I would recommend using... I would recommend using Google Auth just because like it's better than no, it's not better than GitHub, but like it works really well. GitHub is great too. We have it working. Facebook doesn't work right now. But then and then you'll go to our questions list page. And so on the question, questions list, here again, if you're logged in, it'll save all your stuff. And so you can read like our little tutorials or you can hide them. And um, here you have all your questions. So you can see the list of questions. We have difficulty, so we have easy, medium, hard, very hard, and we have extremely hard. There are only a couple here. Um, then you can order them by category, uh, so you can see the categories, like 
dynamic programming, all the categories. We have 16 categories. Um, and again, we handpicked these questions. I think that these are the most important. I think these are the questions that will teach you the most. And I even emphasize categories more so than others. Like dynamic programming, you can see is big compared to like uh, queues, where there's not that much to learn about queues other than like first in. You can fill, fill the rest for me. I forgot here. Um, <laughs> um, so, so that's that's that. Then what you'll notice is right now all the black titles you they're like disabled. We we're like updating the website as we go, but all the um, all the purple titles are you, they're clickable. They're working. Uh, they are right now. We only have dynamic programming questions that you can click, but those are the ones you can access. So what you can do is you can if you're logged in, you can check mark the questions. So this will if you leave the page, so if you go to like this and then you go back, it'll keep them saved, right? Um, and then you can uncheck them. You can also move the order of the questions. So like, let's say you do, you finish longest increasing subsequence, you can move it at the top if you're a bit like organized and you want to have everything there. Um, I, tried to, I tried to implement what I found were the things I was frustrating with, I was frustrated with during my prep. Um, and then what you do is you click on a problem. So let's click on uh, max sum increasing subsequence. Um, and so here you have your workspace. So again, be logged in so that it saves your progress. You have, again, tutorials. You can kind of see them. And then you can toggle them off here. Um, and the way that this is done is it's, it's supposed to mimic the way that I would advise you to prep, which is start by reading a problem. Try to solve it yourself. Struggle through it. And ideally, and that's what we're doing here, we give you test cases that you can test against, kind of like code wars, right? You run your code, and you see that it passes test cases. And you're like, yes, OK, I know that this is passing test cases. You have that kind of confirmation. So at the top corner here, you can see your prompt, see sample input output. Um, you can, here you have your input. So here you can type, like, um, let's just say return minus 1 uh, for this max sum. Um, then you can run your code. So if you run your code, it's going to be processed. And then you'll see that you failed all the test cases. I wonder why. Um, if you're stuck, say you're stuck. OK, we give you a hint. Try building an array of the max sums at each index. Then we give you a second hint. So you, uh, you can see that, yeah, it's blurred. And, and you can unblur it. Um, so you can, you can toggle hints on and off. Then you can look at the optimal space-time complexity. By the way, this is, I think, pretty important because um, as you get better with these algorithms, you'll start to like, like a, a space-time complexity. If you know the space-time complexity, it'll kind of tell you the direction that you're going in. If you see a space-time complexity like n squared, you're like, OK, probably going to have to do a 2D array or like two for loops, right? See something like log n, binary search probably. See something like n cubed n to the fourth, OK, this is like a super difficult problem, like np hard or whatever. Um, and, but obviously, you're not going to be given that in an interview, or most likely not. You might be told, like, implement this in O of n squared time. That's like a type of question. But most likely, you're going to have to be, you're going to be asked, what's the time complexity of this? What's the space complexity of this? But here, we put it as kind of a hint so that if you're kind of stuck or you have an answer and you want to know, is it the best one, you can look at this. Then if you're really stuck and you're passing like all test cases but one, you can look at the test cases. So you'll see, oh, I'm missing this like edge case where there's only like one input, right? Like a one. Um, and so here we have our test cases that we kind of wrote. And then, then you can look at the solution. We can you can look at our solution. So you go to our solution. This is our solution. If you run it, normally if we've done our job correctly, it'll pass the test cases. Um, and you'll you can read the solution. Then if you if you're not a fan of JavaScript, you can go to Python, and suddenly everything's in Python. Um, including your solution. And here it's kind of reset, right? You can say return none. Um, and by the way, if you go back to JavaScript, if you're logged in, it's going to be saved. Your work has been saved. Then you can go to Go and see the solution if you're into Go or Java. Java, right now, we don't have yet, but we're, we're working on it. Um, and then I think the most, I think this is like the most helpful thing is the video explanation. So you have a video explanation. They're all filmed by me. Um, I. I'm hoping that I'm doing a good job at explaining this, uh, the explaining the questions. Uh, you can click the conceptual overview if you want. I'll put sound for just a second, and then I won't bother you with my voice anymore. But 
um, assuming the sound works. Whoops. So you can click the conceptual overview. Hey, everybody, walk out Okay, you can see our thing. You can hear it from, from my computer. Um, so here, I kind of, it's kind of like whiteboardy style. I kind of go through like exactly how you, like fundamentally, how does this problem work? Like, like fundamentally, what is the, how do you approach this problem? Like, where does things, where do things point to, et cetera? And then after that, because that's one thing, it's great. You need to understand an algorithm fundamentally. Like, that's super important. If you don't know how the dynamic programming solution works, you can read the code all you want. You're going to be like, why is he doing, like, why is he initializing an array that way? And so that's when you go to the code walkthrough. And so assuming it loads, you get to the code walkthrough. And again, these are in Python just because I think it's the most readable across the board, but then you can compare to the JavaScript solution at the top. Let me mute this. Um, you can see the, um, the code walkthrough. We go in detail into like how to do it. For some problems, we have a couple solutions, like a less optimal one, a more optimal one, and that's that. Like you, you, you get both, both worlds. Um, let me opt out of that. Um, so that's that, and then you'll, Again, just to show you here, if you were to say like, you know, something, and then you go back to the questions list, you notice things are still saved. If we go back to max sum increasing subsequence, we have our stuff here. Um, then you can log out, log back in, it'll save your progress. And that's that. Again, you can order stuff. If you're logged in, it'll all be saved. And I, I hope that this can be helpful for some, for some of you guys. Right now, you have access to it with the full hopper password. I'd love to get feedback on it. If you, you, if you start using it, uh, you can send us feedback by either you can message me on Slack or like LinkedIn, or you can go here and send us a message and it'll go to like our email. Um, like in the meet the team, you click the email button and tell us if you, if you like it, if it's helpful for you, if there, if there are like UI or backend bugs, by all means tell us. Or if there's something that you're like, oh, that's not really, that's hard to understand. Like, I didn't understand how you did max, K, max profit with K transactions. Tell me, and I'd love to either fix it or even give you a pointer as to how to solve it. And um, I'll be, we'll be updating the website pretty much every day. We're deploying new stuff. At this point, it's mostly like videos and, and making questions more acce uh, accessible. So like, if you, if you use this actively during your prep or after you graduate, you will see every day like new questions pop up in purple. And again, you guys have access to it. Like, I'm not going to make you guys pay or anything. We're not there yet. And um, at this point, I'd rather you guys have access to it for, for free than, than pay it. So, so that's that, algoexpert.io, full hopper, no caps. And uh, again, I'd love to, I'll, I'll stick around for like another 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if any of you want to ask me like personal <laughs> questions. Um, but that's that.